Yeah, I got kind of stressed for once in a while. You just couldn't keep from getting shot at and... And the round just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. And you could just hear them going ting, 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 and everything, and you're going, when is, when is my time? When is my time? My grandfather, his name was Zinnemann. Nobody knew his name was Zinnemann. His name was Zen. What's your name, sir? Zen Watford. So whenever I was born, my mother didn't know his name was Zinnemann. Nobody knew it. So I was named after Zen, him and my grandfather on my mother's side, last name, Zen Davis and in Watford. Davis was her maiden name, and Zen is my grandfather on Watford's side, first name. We knew that, okay? Well, he died in like 56 or 57, and when, we, when we've got his uh, 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 birth certificate and everything else, we found out his name was Zinnemann. I said, boy, I'm glad nobody found out how before I was born. <laughs> I was born in Northern Florida, in a little town called Graceville, Florida. We moved from there seven miles east in Florida, right across the Panhandle, uh, to a little town called Camelton, Florida. And so we just been living in those two small towns for our whole life, you know. Uh, yes, I farmed and blacksmithed and mechanic and done just about everything. I was born and raised learning how to do things. My dad taught me a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. You just watch him do things. I watched him do it. And you get a hammer and a hot piece of steel and you go at it. You hammer it until you think you've got something that <laughs> looks like something. And he comes around and tell you, what is that? I don't know what that is. Make something. So I'd have to go back and make something, you know, and make it real look good. So I was uh, working with my dad from the time I was about eight or nine until I graduated from high school and joined the service. Well, me and my friend, uh, I was uh, helping him at his, uh, he was working for the forestry company at that time. So we were doing that for about a month or two. And uh, I finally told him, I said, you know, I said, we should go down and join the Army. And so he and I went in to see the recruiter and the Army recruiter was not available. And so we was leaving the building and the Marine Corps recruiter stepped out of his office and had his dress blues on. And I looked at that and I said, man, I like that uniform. And so he says, well, I don't know where those guys are, but if you want to join the service, you should join my service. And so we turned around and went right in and joined his service right there that day. It was an accident that, that we got into the Marine Corps. <laughs> it wasn't too bad. I knew how to take orders. My dad was good at giving orders and I knew how to take orders. So it didn't bother me to go in there and listen to that recruiter stand up there in front of us and tell us we had to do this and we had to do that. We, wait, we made out real good in boot camp. When I got to Okinawa and was interviewed by the commanding officer, he asked me what I did before I joined the service. And I told him I worked was as a mechanic with my dad. And I didn't even hardly get the word mechanic out of my mouth before he said, I got a job for you. And I says, oh my gosh, what did I say? <laughs> and so he took me down and introduced me to the warrant officer at the garage and everything down on the camp. I turned out to be a mechanic for the, for the Marine Corps, working on uh, big trucks, little trucks, Jeeps, Caterpillars, tractors, everything that they had and we had, I had to work on it. 
everything. Diesel, I learned it, I learned it all from, from the Marine Corps. One of my um, options was to go to aircraft mechanic school. And I took that and went to Millington, Tennessee for aircraft mechanic school. And uh, learning how to work on the engines that went into aircraft. When I finished, they sent me to uh, New River, North Carolina. And uh, I got put into a helicopter squadron, which was HMM 162 and offloaded in Da Nang in January of 1963. And we were the second helicopter squadron for the Marines that was ever in Vietnam. I had no idea what Vietnam was. Didn't know anything about it. Nobody knew anything about it. I had an M60 machine gun set in the window of the door of my plane. I was a crew chief for the helicopter and I had to make sure that it flew because I didn't want to be down in the ground. So I kept it running real good, kept it all you know tuned up and everything. We had to change the blades and fix the holes where people shot at us. They were actually shooting at us and putting holes in my helicopter. And that was my job to make sure that it was flyable. Every time we went in for a night medevac to go in to get the wounded troops out of the jungles at night, that was the scariest experience that I have ever had in my life. We had to go west of Da Nang. We took off and when it's night in Vietnam, it's black. It is the blackest night you ever want to see in your life. You can't see nothing. When we set down, uh, the guys started running up to the plane and I couldn't tell you where there were VC or where there were Marines. So they come running up and when they did, they was holding, I could see they were holding troops. And so I took, uh, I think it was five wounded aboard my plane. Uh, the VC was firing at that plane with machine guns and everything you can think of. And uh, you could hear the holes going through the plane. Two, two, two. When we started to lift off, they could see the exhaust from the plane, from the engine, and they started honing in on that uh, exhaust and shooting at it. And I have no idea how we got out of there. And my plane, I counted them, we had 57 rounds through the fuselage of my plane when we got back to the camp and I could count them. And some of them was very close to me being I was in the belly of the plane. We just barely made it out of there. I'm not kidding you, and I thank God for it. And I shot that M60 all the time. And I don't know how many rounds of ammunition I put through the barrel that thing. I got the barrel so hot, I got scars on my arms where it burnt me. You know, I'd lay it out like that, and it would burn the hell out of you before you knew it. So I shot that, that M60 quite a lot. I was about as scared of that trip as anything that I've ever done in my life. I don't know of anything that scared me anymore. And uh, I, uh, I dream about it quite often. And it comes hard on me and everything. And I have to wake up and, well, it wakes me up and I have to get up and walk around. And, I don't get back to sleep. So it's just one of those things. I got one or two that does me that way. We were, went down to pick up uh, some troops on the river and the river was down in a valley and they had high banks on each side of the river. 
pretty high, maybe 75, 80 feet, 100. And uh, <clears throat> we started, uh, we, we picked up the troops by the, th by the uh, uh, river and we started lifting up and going towards one of the, uh, on one side of the river when we was gonna make a left and go back towards the dang. And so as we were lifting up, there was about three soldier, uh, VAVC soldiers that got up on the other side of the river on top of the, the cliff there. And the major that was flying the plane said, that son of a bitch is gonna shoot me. And I took my head around the corner, of the, around the door of the plane where I could see, and I could see that the man was aiming at the plane. And he pulled a trigger and you could see the round just about come out of the barrel, that gun. And the major says, oh my God, it is. He did shoot at me. And it did, it hit him right under his right eye, went underneath his right eye and above his, his right ear and came out. And it kind of knocked him out. And the co-pilot had to take over and it was a hell of a switch. And then I had to get the major out of the seat, the, the pilot's seat, down into the belly of the plane so I could lay him out and take care of him. And so that was a hell of a job too, getting him. And I had one troop that was able to get up and help me from the wounded. And he and I got the major down in the, in the belly of the plane and we took care of him until we got back to the airport. But as soon as he got hit, I said, oh gosh, we're gonna crash right into the cliff. But the co-pilot got a hold of the controls and got his hands off of it and time enough to lift it up out of there. But I sure thought we, we were goners at that time too. And that's another one that I have a uh, hell of a time about too. Uh, and yes, I was very, very afraid that it was my time. But thank God that he was looking after me and kept us all protected and we got back to the base and everything. And you know what, I never got shot uh, other than being burnt by the barrel of the gun, not even a scratch on me anywhere else. So thank goodness for that. Uh, some of the other times I, 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 I can't mention, okay? It's just, just, I just can't do it. When I left there in, in 66, which was the end of my second tour over there, I come away from there with nine air medals, and that was uh, 20 missions for air medal. So it was like 180 missions. It was almost 200. I didn't have a, quite a, enough to get the 200, but close. You can hear, thank you, vet, for your service. And sometimes you don't know how to take that. Because when you came home, you didn't get a thank you, vet, for your service. You got baby killer, get out of town and stuff like that. But we all feel the same way. And we do thank them for that because it does help with our healing, okay? I don't care when you hear it, it will give you a little bit of, oh man, you know, straighten your shoulders up and, and walk a little, little tired and a little higher, you know? And it makes you feel better, but it's conflicting with what you got when you first came home. I never thought that would come from American people to their service people that went out and did something that their government ordered them to do. They had no choice to do this. And you know, we went and did it the best we could and they wouldn't let us win the war. And so they took us out of Vietnam and we left all those nice people there in South Vietnam for the communists to come in and take over within a month. It was all communist, and it was really bad. And so that's, you know, when you go fight for something other that's hard as we did, and then 
you you have you're told to pull out and get out of there and everything or they pull us out and we leave all those people behind like that and it's the same thing that is happening right now in Afghanistan and I feel so bad for those troops of what they're going to have to go through whenever they come home now so maybe we can help them maybe all the civilians can get together and help them now okay and not treat them like we got treated when we came home i hope to god that they will do that that's my that's my uh hope and prayer for these troops that come home now this is a, a photo of me and my platoon at uh, Camp Pendleton, California in 1956. We were there for about three months and soon as this picture and everything and we was over with, this whole group went to the, went, went, went to uh, east. And we went into uh, Okinawa, Japan, and the Philippines and different places. I was 21 in this photo. And that's me right there. And that's my f uh, mate, Max Thomas. And we went in the boot camp together and went to ITR together here. When I moved from Southern California up here to Ben in 1999, I had no, didn't have any idea about PTSD. I didn't know what it was, I had no clue what it was. And I kind of quit working. And when I quit working, my mind started going crazy, you know, doing weird things, making me do weird things. We do this every Wednesday. Now, we, we're hoping to get back into the VA sometimes this week. And uh, maybe we can make it, so that'd be cool. And uh, we'd be able to just sit down and enjoy ourselves. Well, no, you can't enjoy ourselves any better than we do here. This is great, okay? Larry, are you here? I'm here, yep. Oh my goodness, you guys are early. I work with vets. We keep these pretty private in our community for uh, the people with PTSD. I was snapping at my wife. I was hollering at her, I was cussing at her. I don't care, she would just do some little thing and it would hit me immediately. They call them triggers. Just like I didn't know who the hell I was. I was getting that way. It's always with you. The PTSD is always gonna be there. And we just try not to let it control us. That's the big thing. Try to control it, not let it control you. And it's sometimes it's really hard to do. That is why we have these PTSD meetings and gathering here and at the VA. And it's, to, it's for us to get that out of our system. And we get a lot of stuff off our chest and out of our mind and, and our hearts and everything. And it's just grateful that we can get together like this. And it does so much help for us. And I really appreciate it doing it. I have had the best life anybody could ever have. Even going through Vietnam, the two tours, you know, it was, it was scary and I just, I lost, you know, some of my hair and my hair turned purple and white and everything. And so, but you know, it was still okay. I was okay with it over there and the good Lord took care of me and brought me home. And he took care of me through all my life and he's been with me and I, I appreciate that. And I've got a wonderful family and I've got two wonderful families. So, you know, it's just been great.